simple bowl and this is going to be a little different than most bowls you see uh, the first part I want to do rather quickly because we talked about how to shape a bowl I'm going to go back to my regular chuck uh, here's my bowl blank again it is a recess it is a two and one eighth inch recess so it's as close to the diameter of these jaws on the chuck as I can get them. the closer to the closed jaws the more contact you're going to have on that outside edge contrary to popular belief how much of the jaws are actually holding that in there does anybody know yeah, it's, it's a small fraction because the curvature of the jaw is going to be different than the curvature of your insulin. not even more than that there's two little rings on there and there's one eighth inch in thickness between the two rings that's all that holds that piece in there because behind that it tapers down so your contact is only an eighth inch deep <coughs> your tenon only in reality needs to be an eighth inch deep now I make mine a little deeper than that so it doesn't split out the top but you don't need a three eighths inch hole and you definitely don't want it to bottom out on the face of the chuck so we're going to expand out And I'm not going to talk a lot while I get this set up because I want to go rather quickly. Back up. I want the chuck set all the way in. And I like to have one finger width after the chuck is set in between the piece and the chuck. Lock it down and then set it in with the quill. Otherwise, I'll occasionally slide it up and the live center won't be set all the way in the shaft and then it starts wobbling I'm going, what's wrong? And it's just nothing's wrong, it's just I didn't have it set right. Lock it in, turn my speed down. Now my bowl is going to be a flat top bowl. Uh, this is the design we're going for. It's going to be a flat top bowl. Uh, basic shape, very simple. But what this allows, and I've got to be somewhere, uh, then you can cut through this with a reciprocating carver and make all sorts of patterns on the top of your bowl. You can do wood burning on the top of your bowl, you can color, you can texture it. And that's the reason I got into the ring bowls, is to have the uh, flexibility to do other things with it. Uh, here I'm going to just start, and the first cut's actually going to start a shaping, come in and come around. Now I want to make sure I leave enough edge back there that it doesn't split out of the chuck. Alright, I can't get black any further, so I'm going to come in this way and start shaping going backwards, but I'll clean it up in a little bit. And I think that's really a pot belly bowl and I don't like it. It's my bowl, I can make it any shape I want. That's looking better, but I still don't like it. I want that curve to start right here at the lip. There we go. As I go down, I want the curve to tighten. Now I want to just get rid of waste wood here. Then I've got to be aware of where those jaws are. Now I'm going to leave that much thickness there to support the top while I'm working on it. And while I'm making the inside of the bowl. If I get it too small, 
side drain, it'll just pop right off. So I want to just leave as much of that as I need to be able to shake. This is cleaning all my fibers up. Notice it went from shiny to just a smooth finish. And that's what I want. I don't want that shiny because that's just bent fiber burnished over. The first time I saw Ray Key, who was probably one of my favorite turners, I was fortunate enough to take a class with him. And he did his first project. He literally started sanding the whole thing with 220 grit sandpaper. If you need to start sanding with 100 grit, 80 grit, start with 180, 100 or 80 grit sandpaper. There's no embarrassment there. Because nobody in the shop's going to know what you started with, but they'll know what it looks like when you're done. Get rid of those ridges, get rid of those little gouge marks with the coarse sandpaper, then go 80, 100, 120, 140, 180, whichever you have, uh, 220, 320, 400, and I will not stop below 400 grit. Most of the time I go up to 6 or 800. The faster you turn the lathe, the less sanding you're doing, the more burnish you're doing. When I'm sanding, my lathe doesn't turn above 300 RPMs. It gives time for the dust to come out of the paper so it's not polishing wood on wood. It's still sanding. If you're turning at 800 to 1,000 RPMs, man, this is going like crazy. All you're doing is making shiny wood. It's not just sanding it. It's just burnishing it in. Okay, now the top of this piece, I need it as flat as possible. Uh, I think from the side camera, can we flip? crawl in. I've got a defect there and I've got to get that defect out. Now, I can work a little bit here with the tailstock up and I'm going to. I'm going to move my tool left around so I can get in there easily. And I'm just going to do little push cuts in. I'm going to bring the speed back up. A push cut will give you a cleaner cut because it's pushing on the side grain. That should get me below it. Now some people will tell you to do delicate work, you need a smaller tool. And I would disagree with that because if I use anything less than a 3 8 inch bowl gouge and I'm over the tool rest two inches, it's chattering. And I don't want chatter in my tool. Okay, so I'm going to back off my tailstock now. Again, I'm going to get my tattoo machine taken off. I want that dot in the center to be right in the center of my tool. And to do that, I've got to get it clear down there, so I need to raise my tool rest. That's too high, and I'll go over it. I want to be able to go right through it. And that keeps that little button in the center from starting. Once it starts, it's hard to get rid of. So I can come in, pick up my cut where I left off, and just slide right across. Now when you get to the center, you really want to put very little pressure on the tool and go very slowly. Reason being, if you come out here, it picks it up, brings it around, and slams it down. If it slams, it's okay. If it's a soft thud, that means your finger got underneath of it. And that's not okay. Uh, normally it leaves that purplish color. Right, then I want to check to make sure it's as flat as I can get it across the face. And center's high. And it's a bad habit to leave tools up on the ways of your bed. And find where that double ride is. And 
both arms go parallel as much as possible. Right through that center slowly and easily. And I like it where it is, so I'm stopping. It's a little low in the center, but I'm going to cut that out. So I'm not worried about it. Now you're going to become the artist. I'm going to put an act. Well, first I'm going to take and if you were to look closely, you notice I've got three scars on the back of my wrist. That's from going up and bumping that edge. And they're burn scars, not cut scars. So, and dry wood, it's sharp enough to cut you. So whenever I'm working around that, I take my tool and just barely knock off. That's all I need. Just that much and I'll round it off enough that it doesn't hurt. But if you leave that sharp edge there, you're in trouble. All right, now you're going to become the artist this way if it's wrong, it's your fault. Uh, I need my point tool. Uh, this is very similar to the box tool. Uh, it's about a 25 degree angle and it cuts unbelievably well. When I sharpen it, turn it up, there we go, it works better that way. I sharpen both sides on an angle down so they don't touch the side of the wood when it's cutting. And across the nose, there is a flat spot on that point. If you don't have that flat spot there, it'll want to skate on you. And it's just, I mean, it's not even a 64th of an inch. It's just enough that I can see that there's a shiny edge right on that front point. Uh, if you don't have it and you mistouch the least little bit, it's going to go, and you go, oh no, a redesign opportunity. All right, I'm going to put one ring on the outside. When I use this tool, I want the point on center or slightly above, and the handle is very high. The reason the handle's high, it's pushing the fibers back into the wood. If I put the handle flat or lowering it, it's pulling it out and I get splinters all over the place because these are no sand cuts. I'm just going to put an accent ring on the outside, handle high. I'm going to sneak up on it, breathe when you do it. And a very nice little accent ring. Quick, easy, <coughs> no sanding necessary. Uh, but if you take it in flat or the handle down, it's going to pull those fibers out and splinter. So always high. All right, now. You get to become the artist. I'm going to turn this one over so everybody can look at it. You tell me where, what size of bowl we want, and I'm going to draw it, and you, you can tell me bigger or smaller, and I'll do whatever you say tonight. Bigger. Bigger? Speak up. Bigger? How many agree bigger? Bigger. Okay. Bigger or okay? Bigger. Okay. I got bigger. one okay. How many how many say it's okay? That's a ring bone, right? It's a ring bone. Yeah, bowl. but you guys can wear big rings. You got bigger fingers. Okay. I don't care about the size of the ring at all. I'm looking at proportions. Okay, what, what's our general proportion rule? There's two two variances that who can tell me. Golden rule. Okay, golden rule, approximate numbers for that are one third, two thirds. So if I make this one third, I should be able to put that bowl there and there, and we're pretty close. But I'm gonna put an accent ring around it about here, about the same size as that, and it's gonna make it look larger. So we're gonna go with your design. I'm going to tell you about the tool I'm going to use for that. And I'm going to break some people's heart here. Uh, let's see. Am I... Yeah, that's going to work better there on the side camera. All right. Uh, most of your tools are hollow ground off the grinder, which means the grinder curve is on the back side. If I make a bowl that small, or a bowl that small, with that hollow grind, the back part of the tool is going to bruise that wood all the way through. It's going to pull the nose off, which is going to make it tear. 
and it's physically impossible to do it with a 3 8 inch bowl gouge unless you get rid of the bevel. All right, there's some of the sharpeners out there that leave a flat edge on the bottom. Sorby is one of them, good tool. Come in with that, still on an arc that big, there's a void there, so the heel's rubbing and the nose is tearing. The best tool is one, the radius of the back is smaller than the bowl you're making. Because now I've got it cutting with just the nose and minimal contact behind it. And you say, well, you can't do that and keep control of the bowl. You do it all the time. Because when you're cutting on the outside of a bowl, if you've got a flat tool, in order for the front to cut, the rest of the bevel's off the tool. It's not touching, unless it's a perfect match. Now, so if you're undercut and the bowl, bowl is smaller than your radius here, you're up in the air and the bevel's not touching at all. So. The, the amount of bevel touching is minuscule. Well, I've got a 3 8 inch bowl gouge, and maybe I do. And it is a flat across bevel. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and I said, well, I've got to get rid of that. So I'm going to take it over to the grinder, and I'm just freehand and going to get rid of much of that as I can in a very small radius. Uh, and I'm going to do it with the coarser stone to do it in a hurry. And I keep bringing the handle towards me and round it out. And I've got about a quarter inch left there, so I need to get that off. And it doesn't need to go all the way around the tool, just the nose. You see how rounded that is? That allows me to go through there without the back end burnishing and scarring up the bowl as I go. The disadvantage to it is it's going to want to skate across the front of that so fast it'll make your hair stand on end if you had any. Not that I'm talking to anybody in particular, that's all right. <laughs> I'm catching up to you quickly. All right, so to stop skating, if you will take and have your tool enter with the flute straight up and down, and the way I do that is I want to finish my cut here comfortable. That's comfortable for me. I'm standing in the right position with my legs comfortable, and I'm going to make my hand start uncomfortable by coming forward and rolling that flute straight up and down. If I do that, the nose of the chuck should just sit, well, I got it over too much. Try it again. There it is. And it'll stay there and ride all day. As soon as I go like that, though, it's going to take off to the side. So if I know that and I got my thumb on the back or my hand on the back and won't let it slide, so my wrist is uncomfortable here, the advantage to that is when I start to pull it towards me, my wrist will automatically roll over to my comfortable position. So I always start uncomfortable and work to comfortable. Your body will get comfortable. It doesn't like being uncomfortable. Now this is honesty time. How many of you have ever started to cut on the inside of a bowl and you're taking steps as you go? Every time you take a step, it puts a ridge in the bowl. So there's a way to do that and not do it, it's turn, stop, take the tool out, move your feet, and slide back in and catch it. Or to do it, what I call a hero cut. On a small bowl, you do the hero cut and start in one swoop. Um, but every time you move your feet, it's a step. Every time you change your wrist position, it's gonna make a groove in your bowl. How many of you have almost tripped yourself over trying to get out of the way of the tool? You're going like this, I almost got it. <coughs> okay. I'm almost comfortable, and now I'm comfortable. 
So if you start uncomfortable, you won't start in an uncomfortable enough position to get yourself in trouble. If you end up comfortable, you'll have a smoother, cleaner cut. Now, hopefully I haven't lied to you too much. All right, here's where I'm comfortable. I'm very comfortable standing there. My hand's comfortable here. I'm gonna have my thumb. No, I'm not, I'm gonna have my hand on the tool rest for stability. And I'm gonna have that little ridge there by my little finger up against the back of it. So if it does want to skate, hopefully I can stop it before I lose the whole thing. The nice part about it, if I get a skate all the way across, if I'm home, nobody knows that happened and I just make a shorter bowl. Mm -hmm. It's okay. That's it, all right, so here I'm comfortable. I gotta reach over so far, my wrist is cocked over. I'm gonna wait till I get a little groove shining, or showing, I should say. There's my groove as I pull my arm towards me. Sweep on through. Very smooth, controlled action, hopefully. And I got just a little tiny ridge in the very bottom, but a good clean cut. Now, that is a bowl for somebody that's on an M&M diet. <laughs> we want to go larger. At least you all said you wanted to. Same thing, uncomfortable. Get my little groove started. There's my groove in, solid. Roll it back towards me. And through again. And every cut's the same. This inside smoother than the outside. That's a good thing. All right, same cut again. I'm going to go a little deeper. You go deeper, you just sort of slow your rotation down. Okay, we'll go a little deeper. And if you remember to breathe, it's a help. You pass out after a certain point. Now you notice the cuts are getting lighter. Lighter cuts have less tendency to tear out. Got a bad spot in the bottom. Can't have that. That's better. What do you think about the size of your bowl now? How many of you like it where it is? Okay. So we're going to go back to our point tool. I'll pass this one around in just a minute. Where's my handle? Help me out here. Where's my handle go? High. High. Cutting point. Where should it be? Center or slightly above. I want that distance approximately the same weight distance from the bowl. And there's your ring bowl. I'm borderline on the bowls too small, personally. Just maybe a little. Uh, it's close enough, it wouldn't matter. Most people don't get picky about it. Uh, but we have one of these in our bathroom sink. We have one of them by the kitchen sink. We have uh, a couple of them in, in each bedroom. Uh, so if you want to take off a ring at night, your rings or whatever, you just drop it in the bowl. Use a finish that is water resistant. Polyurethane is a good finish. Because if it's by the sinks, it's going to get splashed and splattered. 
I'm going to show a little bit about how I finished, but I'm going to leave this intact so whoever can take it home and finish it. They, a couple companies are now selling nylon jaws. I make mine out of wood. I make them for the size of projects I'm doing. Uh, and I, I don't, wait, don't take that away. I'm not done with that. Thank you, Buzz, for the help, but not yet. <laughs> uh, I like wooden jaws because they're soft enough, they don't mar the piece. Let's use the right key. Use the hard maple for the jaws. I use hard maple for the jaws. My jaws are numbered. Uh, so that they go on the same one. This is supposedly set three. Uh, and I can reshape them. I can come in and make them wider if I want to. Hopefully this will fit. It's going to be really close. No, it's not. Okay, it's not going to fit. Anyway, normally that would go in there, lock down on it, and I can finish this off completely. Option number two is a little less safe, but I use it quite a bit. <laughs> Uh, I do pieces that are way too big to fit in here, and I have a vacuum chuck at the house, uh, and I use the vacuum chuck quite a bit. I can't do that either. <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell you about it. This goes into, the, I can't put it in the jaws because this won't let it go through. It goes in, and then that slides right up there, and nothing more than a pressure fit. And to clean off the small spot here, it works great. Uh, but preferably, if you can lock that face in, it's just a little bit safer. You put it, you put a vacuum on the... Uh, uh, it, yeah, I put a vacuum on it, but it also works fine without it. Because I, this is concave, so it's got a rough edge, or a high edge there to keep it in tight. And then the rubber is uh, cemented to it, so it holds it in pretty tight. Uh, which will finally just leave me with a little uh, button on the bottom to have to knock off.